number two jersey. The freaky three for Tennessee. It's two a time in Miami. We get Justin Fields was drafted to be the guy. Justin Fields will be the week one star. He's QB1. How do we say Cam News name on this show? Cam Damn News. Good dance moves in that video right there. As we said, 18 teams holding mandatory mini camps this week. That's all of them right there. That means stories galore. Everything you need to know around the league is coming your way today. The latest from Miami is on the way. We'll tell you about Tua's struggles in practice today. Find out if anyone here thinks there's cause for legitimate concern. Jeff Darlington with a live report for you. Plus, Bill Belichick continues to praise Cam Newton. A report with Mike Reese is happening, and that'll be coming your way soon. The latest on the quarterback battle in New England after Mac Jones reportedly struggled. Who starts day one for the Pats? Also, Julio Jones on the field today for the Titans. Teron Davenport is joining us with everything you need to know about this wide receiver tandem. Plus, the reason someone here says it's still Derrick Henry who you have to stop no matter what. Welcome to NFL Live, everybody. Glad you're here in just a bit. Why Aaron Rodgers' shirt speaks louder than his words. We finally heard from him for the first time in weeks. Lewis Riddick and Mina Kimes with you for the hour, as well as Adam Schefter. And let's roll with the top stories of the day. We begin with Adam. Some key defensive backs aren't at mandatory minicamp this week. Give us the latest, starting with Jamal Adams. Laura, Seattle's Pro Bowl defensive back, the safety they traded a bunch of picks for last summer, is not present at mandatory minicamp. Now, the Seahawks say it's an excused absence. He is dealing with a couple of personal issues, but that contract does loom on the horizon. And just because he's been excused for this week doesn't change the fact that he wants a new contract. Meanwhile, Miami, there's another defensive back that wants a new contract, Xavier Howard. The issue is he just got a new contract in May of 2019, a huge new extension, but wants another extension right now. He also was not at the Dolphins' mandatory minicamp today. This is an issue that will be worth tracking moving forward, and we've noted the fact that Stephon Gilmore also wants a new contract. Seems like everybody these days does, and is not at the Patriots' mandatory minicamp. Now, he's not fully healthy, couldn't have participated even if he were there, but again, this is one of those situations that hangs over Gilmore and the franchise. He wants more money. Howard wants more money. Adams wants more money. Who doesn't want more money? I mean, I'm good with with my money, actually. Adam, (laughs) I don't know about you. Uh, Jalen Ramsey actually just tweeted, and we got to see this. Look, I see some holdouts, LOL. Time to do some more recruiting, I guess. Adam, I'm going to give you a word on this one. Jalen Ramsey's been recruiting people all over the place. He was trying to recruit Stephon Gilmore yesterday. Well, he's tried to recruit Stephon Gilmore, and now that Jalen Ramsey's been paid, he could essentially add that to his title, along with Pro Bowl defensive back, (laughs) ace recruiter for the Los Angeles Rams. It doesn't really have to be that hard of a sell, though, Laura. You're in Los Angeles around Matthew Stafford, Sean McVay. That's an easy sell. The problem is the Rams don't have a lot of cap space. They can't afford all these stars, no matter how much Jalen Ramsey wants to recruit them. Yeah, their front office is like, all right, Jalen, you can keep doing this, but like, we can't pay these guys. Maybe L.A. is enough of a sell. Someone else who's skipped minicamp. More of Adam Schefter coming your way. Aaron Rodgers, though, no surprise there, of course, as the saga between Rodgers and Green Bay is here to stay. So we haven't heard from Rodgers since his interview with Kenny Mayne a handful of weeks ago. Today he spoke, and listen to this. It's been one of those quiet off seasons you just dream about where you can just kind of go through your process uh, on your own quietly, and, um, you know, that's all you can ask for as an older player in the league and someone who's been around for a long time and just – enjoys that time to yourself to just relax to not be bothered to not have any obligations or anything going on and you know i think that's what this offseason has been about it's been about really enjoying my time and spending it where i want to spend it and not feeling like i have to go anywhere not having any responsibilities but still being an nfl player so this part of his promotion for the match coming up with tom brady those two together today was must see tv I don't know, guys, could you sense a little bit of sarcasm there from Aaron Rodgers, the shirt Lewis saying, I'm offended. What do you got for me after hearing what Rodgers said today? Man, you know, th- think about this. Think about this juxtaposition. Here, here he's saying, I have no responsibilities. I don't have to go anywhere. I just kind of spend my time how I want. He's under contract as the starting quarterback of mm. the Green Bay Packers, and he's talking as if he really doesn't have any obligation to be anywhere at all. That just tells you his mindset, which is saying this. Hey, Mark Murphy. Hey, Brian Gutekunst. I'm on my time. I'm doing it my way now. 
And that shirt right there, of course, you know the way it's framed. I'm offended, sitting right up there, big and bold, right there on the screen. Look, Aaron's a very, very, very smart individual. Anybody who spent more than a minute talking to him can figure this out. Nothing he says is kind of like just off the cuff and not already calculating what the ramifications of what he is saying are actually going to be. He knows exactly what they are. He sent a very clear message saying this. I'm not even thinking about what y'all are doing right now. Okay, I'm worried about me right now, and I'm going to put the focus on me despite the fact that you want me there and despite the fact that I'm so obligated really to be there. I'm not operating that way. That's sending a message. There's no doubt. That's sending a message. You know, Lewis, you said something there that I think is really important, which is for Rogers, it seems like this is about control, taking back some control and exerting control and exerting mm -hmm. what leverage he does have. And this was part of an interview with Tom Brady. And we didn't show this part, but Tom Brady was kind of ribbing Rogers about the Packers not going for it, right? You remember not going for the field goal. And that was just jokes because the issue with Rodgers, it's not about coaching decisions. I mean, maybe he was unhappy about that, but that's not why they're in this situation. I think the juxtaposition between him and Tom Brady is actually much more telling of why we're here, which is you've got two different quarterbacks, two, two of the most comparable quarterbacks in football in terms of the greatest of all time conversation who have very different relationships with their franchises. And when it comes to control and power, you've got a quarterback in Aaron Rodgers who reportedly was not told by his organization when they were gonna draft his replacement. And you've got a quarterback in Tom Brady who was scouting wide receivers for the Bucks. That to me is what this is all about. It's about respect and relationships mm -hmm. and control and Aaron Rodgers trying to get back some of it. And Mina, we've talked all off season about the Tom Envy going on across the league. No matter what anybody says, Russell Wilson has it in Seattle. Aaron Rodgers has it in Green Bay. Maybe Deshaun Watson had it in Houston. They see that Tom Brady left a situation that didn't make him entirely happy, went to a place where they catered to everything that he wanted and needed. If he said he wanted a wide receiver like Antonio Brown, they got him. If he said they wanted a wide receiver like Leonard Fournette, well, he was added to the roster. Everything Tom wanted, they did to placate him. And so these other quarterbacks see that, and now, instead, while they're getting ready for the match, we see Aaron Rodgers on a Zoom call where he gets to wear what he wants, <laughs> where he gets to position his shot the way he likes to, and he's got prominently displayed, I'm offended. I'm offended. Now, what we need to do is we need to get one of those T-shirts for Lewis Riddick, who also is offended quite a bit. <laughs> Lewis Riddick's got to be wearing Ruined. one of those T-shirts no. that says, I'm offended, because Lou's getting angry a lot of the time. And so rather than him have to voice all this anger and frustration, he can no. just put on his T-shirt and let his T-shirt send the same message that Aaron Rodgers sent today, I'm offended. Yo, Lou, you really look offended all, right now. Hey. <laughs> Hey, you know what? You know why I'm smiling, Laura? Because Adam, look, we've worked together for quite a while now, since 2013. He's exactly right. Oh, He's yeah, exactly yeah. right. Hey, let's dial up one of these shirts. We're going to get one for you too, Adam. But Mina and I, we're not offended at all. Hey, more from that interview is coming later on NFL Live. Hear what you have to hear from Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady. Plus, a live report from Dolphins Camp where Tua Tunga by Lewis through fall. Hell yeah! Odell Beckham Jr.'s production has significantly dropped off since arriving in Cleveland in 2019. In his last season with the Giants, Beckham ranked top 10 in the NFL in receiving yards per game, but that number has dropped by almost 20 yards in each season since. Of course, Beckham suffered a torn ACL in Week 7 last season, but his teammate Jarvis Landry is excited in what he's seen so far from his teammate this offseason. Man, he looked he looked amazing. I can't wait for you guys to, to, to see him. Um, but he's 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 in fantastic shape and, and he's ready to go. He's only what six and a half months and he's already doing some things that's this will blow your mind away. And I'll tell you what, this, this guy right here, Odell Beckham Jr., but you just think about what the kinds of things that he can do on a football field as far as being a three-position wide receiver, an X, a Z, and he can play in the slot, which they call the E position in some schemes. That, that Adding that kind of explosive playmaking ability to an offense that really found itself late in the season last year, I think that right now has to have Cleveland fans going, 
man, this just keeps getting better and better for us. And Odell just needs to fit in. Doesn't have to do anything spectacular. Just fit in. And this football team, the upside is just unlimited for this offense and this team overall. And, hey, Baker Mayfield, don't worry about him. Just get the ball to everybody. All right, let's go to the Steelers. Just two weeks ago, Ben Roethlisberger said his Steelers offense will be nothing like it's been before. In fact, the exact quote was, you'll see nothing you saw in the past. Pittsburgh does have a new offensive coordinator, Matt Canada. Today he made it clear it's all about Ben. Quarterback is the, the focal point, and, you know, it's the greatest position in all sport, in my opinion, because all the things you have to do, and we're going to do what Ben wants to do and how Ben wants to do it. We have to be able to run the ball. Mr. Rooney has set out a very clear clear directive to Mr. Kohler, to Coach Tomlin, and then to me. We want to be able to run the ball when we have to run. It doesn't mean we're going to run the ball for X amount of yards in a game. All that matters here is winning. So... I have mixed feelings about that because there's no doubt that Pittsburgh needs to run the ball better than they did last year, but that wasn't the only problem with this offense. They couldn't run the ball effectively. They couldn't block effectively. Uh, there were drops with the wide receivers, and of course, Ben Roethlisberger struggled throwing the ball deep down the air. I think that's everything. Anyways, uh, th there's hope that the drafting of Najee Harris will address at least one of those issues, that the offensive line will look better. But frankly, I think you need to see some schematic changes, the kind that Steelers fans were hoping for with the promotion of Matt Canada to rejuvenate this offense because otherwise it's going to look just like it did in the second half of last season. Yeah, now you can be a weapon catching the ball too. You got to think they use that. Heading into last season, Lamar Jackson continued to say it wasn't about his individual accolades, but instead about their team success, ultimately winning a Super Bowl. And despite those lofty goals, the Ravens once again struggled in the postseason, losing to the Titans in the playoffs. That loss is still fresh on their minds. Well, the one happy team at the end of the year, you know, and Obviously, we want to be the happy team at the end of the year. And last year, we felt like we had a good chance, but we didn't get it done. We got a bad taste to get out of our mouths, and we plan on doing it, you know, starting today. You can't be in the league this long and play at the level that those guys you're talking about played at are playing at and not be just completely highly motivated, and they are. And uh, unfinished business is a, is a term, you know, I guess you could apply it. Yeah, I think for this team to take the next step offensively, they have to take the next step as far as being able to threaten the third level of a defense outside the numbers. And they addressed that clearly this past offseason at the wide receiver position. When they go out and they get a guy like Sammy Watkins, they, they draft Rashad Bateman, they draft Tylen Wallace. These guys are all home run hitters, outside lane vertical threats that can also take the short pass and turn it into the long game because that's what Lamar needs to supplement what is already a deadly deadly running game if they can get that and they can develop that and take that to the next level this team will go to the next level lewis the bills impressed last season warming the hearts of bills mafia with a run to the afc championship game and still they came up short against the chiefs josh allen has a chance to build on a pivotal year where he took a major leap and most everything stays intact including his offensive coordinator brian dable here's allen at camp today we have the base and the foundation for what we want to do. But now it's going out there and executing, um, communicating, and making sure that we're getting dialed in with each other and uh, competing against each other. Ultimate goal is to make the playoffs um, and give yourself a chance for, for a world title. And, um, you know, that's what we got to do. So, you know, Allen made a good point there, which is that they've got the base. The foundation of this offense is strong. They were one of the most efficient units in football last year. So the question is, okay, how do you get from great to Super Bowl. And to me, that goes back to the AFC Championship, a couple areas where they came up short. Josh Allen panicking a, a bit post-snap when Steve Spagnuolo, the Chiefs defensive coordinator, was showing him different looks, tricking him, and then running the football. Now, that is, again, not the core of their offense, and it doesn't need to be, but Brian Dable needs to be able to go to that as a change-up when defenses are giving them the option to run with lighter boxes. And you didn't really see that with Buffalo last year. Hopefully, that's the area where they can improve this season. Yeah, if Josh Allen makes even anywhere close to the leap that he made last season, that's really scary. I don't think that'll happen because it was a huge leap, but you never know. All right, we got so much more coming your way on NFL Live. It was the play call that started all the drama for Aaron Rodgers and Lambeau. Coming up next, you don't want to miss Tom Brady trapped. Yeah, I, I'll never, I'll never push anyone to do anything, so he can choose whatever he wants to do. I well, I usually don't get the option in my. That, that's what <laughs> I mean. You fi you'll finally have the option, Aaron. <laughs> Can't. DeChambeau knew what he was talking about there. All right, Lewis, what do you got? I love it. 
in the, in the infamous me, uh, gif that is Dwayne Wade, I love every second of that. <laughs> Aaron is just, every chance he gets, he's letting people know, yeah, it's a new day. You see how he has his hair slicked back, too? Aaron is not messing around this offseason, man. <laughs> yeah, this is I, a new guy right now. He's telling him, this is, this is the new and improved A-Rod. I couldn't yeah. tell if it was the slicked back A-Rod. or if it was, like, in a man bun. Did anybody else feel that way? We didn't see yeah. a side shot, so I don't, I'm not totally sure, but... Uh, we'll get everybody Either looking one at it. is real aggressive. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, more coming from that interview promoting the match later on in the show. But let's get to this. 18 teams in camp this week gearing up for the season, rapidly approaching. But the Texans canceled their mini camp this week. Of course, they've got a ton of questions to be answered as you look at their whole situation. And a lot of them have to do with a timeline that has to do with Deshaun Watson. So here's what Nick Casario, the GM of the Texans, said today, I don't have any additional comments about anything as it relates to Deshaun. I think we're respectful of what's happening, respectful of the process, everybody that's involved. The most important thing is for all of us, the coaches, players, myself included, focus on the things we can control as we get more information. We'll try to make that best decision for the Houston Texans, whatever that entails. Adam Schefter, what more can you tell us about the timeline here with Deshaun Watson and what the Texans may do going forward? Well, there's a lot of different ways this still can go, Laura, and I think the Houston Texans are seeking clarity from the NFL, from legal authorities to see what's going to happen, whether Deshaun Watson is going to be placed on the commissioner exempt list, to see whether he would be disciplined, to see whether he would be cleared and could resume practicing. But I think across the league, there's a widespread assumption that the Texans are operating right now as if they won't have Deshaun Watson. And just look at all the moves that they made this offseason. They went out and signed Tyrod Taylor. They used their first draft pick on Davis Mills, the quarterback from Stanford. They gave a half million dollars in guaranteed money to Jeff Driscoll. That's three quarterback moves that this team has made. They wouldn't be making those moves if they were confident that Deshaun Watson were going to be the quarterback of this team. Everything is in limbo right now. They are awaiting further word and a decision from other people before they have to decide what to do. Yeah, Adam, a reminder that the Texans signed Deshaun Watson to a four-year, $156 million extension just last September, has him under contract through the 2025 season. We'll keep you updated on all this as we get more information. Let's get to more camp news, though, around the league. Julio Jones said it was extremely important to show up to voluntary workouts last week with the Titans to get more accustomed to his new squad, experience the vibe of the team. You see him right now. He's out there on the practice field today, of course, getting his shot with Ryan Tannehill. A.J. Brown actually was watching this uh, from the sideline. Let's get more on that. Let's bring in Teron Davenport, who covers the Titans for us. Teron, Julio's first day with the full roster at camp, but there was one notable name not on the field. Tell us more. Yeah, unfortunately, A.J. Brown was not on the field today, so Mike and Scotty, Scott and, and, and everybody else, you know, Shaq and Kobe, these are duos that, aren't going to be able to be duplicated here right away for the Titans. But, you know, Julio Jones was out there. He worked a lot with Ryan Tannehill. He spent a lot of time with Rob Moore. So there's still some learning there, and he's going to be a very positive influence for all of the receivers here. Yeah, Teron, it is really important, I think, for Julio that he has some familiarity with this type of offense already. Certainly helps him to kind of hit the ground running there in Tennessee. Thanks so much, Teron Davenport, for joining us here. And adding Julio Jones to go along with Derrick Henry and A.J. Brown gives the Titans some serious size with their playmakers. Look at this. Over the last two seasons, there are just 10 players who are at least 6 feet tall and 225, 220 pounds that have gained 2,000 scrimmage yards. Three of them are now on the Titans. So good luck to opposing defenses to try to tackle these guys. Mina, you see that showing just the sheer size of the skill players on this offense. How has the addition of Julio changed the strength of this Titans team? I mean, look at it. <laughs> you saw the video. Like, if we were handing out Super Bowls based on how guys look before they put on pads, I'd give the Titans the ring right now because uh, that duo of wide receivers and Derrick Henry is insanely intimidating. Um, and, and look, the, the Titans are going to change, Laura. Th this is a team that had a very strong offensive identity under previous offensive coordinator Arthur Smith. A lot of play action, running the football, using more 12 personnel with two tight ends on the field than any team in the NFL. Some of that is, gonna ch is going to stay the same. Uh, because it plays to Ryan Tannehill's strengths, and of course they still have Henry, but 
The strength of this team is now the group of wide receivers, the trio with Josh Reynolds. They're going to be on the field a lot. And what that means is defenses are going to have to play more too high safety and it's going to be easier for Derrick Henry to run the football. It's beautiful in Tennessee. Like I'm very <laughs> excited to watch this offense because now they have so many options at their disposal. Yeah, listen, I think every offense, ideally, as we know, wants to be multiple. They want to put you in a quandary as a defense as far as deciding, now, how do I want this team to beat me? Or, you know, if you flip it around, how do I want to defend this team? What do I want to take away from this team? Because in the past, everything has been Derrick Henry, Derrick Henry, Derrick Henry. Stop him no matter what. Now they're going to force you to choose. Do you want to commit more people to the box? Do you want to play more single high or play more split high, meaning cover four instead of cover two, where the safeties can insert into the run quickly, or do you not? Or do you want to lay back and make sure that Julio and AJ don't burn you over the top? Personally, you know, for me, I'm going to say this. From watching this team up close and seeing them in the playoffs last year, if you shut down Derrick Henry and you bang on him and, make, and you take him out of the game, that has a tangible effect on the confidence of this offense. Because if they feel like this, if you can, if you can just absolutely stop Godzilla in pads, then everything else is going to fall apart for them, and it really messes with their mindset. And so, and, that, and then what that does is, it, you know, people are saying, then, hey, look, Ryan Tannehill, I don't care what they paid you, I don't care how good your next gen stats are, prove to us that you can beat us, prove to us that you can take advantage of these one, one on ones on the outside. And what Tennessee has done now, with with Julio, is saying this: go ahead and stack the box if you want. We believe in Ryan Tannehill. Ryan and AJ together, along with Julio, is a formidable, formidable duo, or rather trio right there. So look, I think they made it, I made they made the perfect addition here. The question is, can they take advantage of this of these new personnel groupings that they have to put on the football field? All right, so Lewis, if you're the defensive coordinator, you're gonna say, no matter what, I'm gonna stop <laughs> Derrick Henry, see who else can beat me. But Ooh. Mina, let me give yeah. you a chance to be DC here. What do you do? Because <sighs> I, mean, I, I hear that, but it's like then you then you're gonna try to see if Julio Jones, if AJ Brown can somehow go over the top and get you. It's a nightmare because whereas previously it was Corey Davis, who's a very good wide receiver, very good number two, running those deep crossers off of play action, it's Julio Jones now. There are no <laughs> right answers defensively against this offense. I mean, Lewis is right. It's, it's like a math problem that can't be solved. Yeah, so this is a story for a different day, but I think now it comes down to this Titans defense. Can they hold up on their side of the ball yep. to really make this a complete mm -hmm. team in that division? We got more coming your way on NFL Live. And coming up, Derek Carr has gotten the blame for many of the Raiders' struggles this past year, or the few past years. But someone here is tired of all that slander. I'm going to tell you why it's not Derek Carr's fault. We'll be right back. And yards per drop back have increased in all three seasons. His QBR has gone from ranking 27th in 2018 all the way to 11th last season. Carr made it known just how important it was for him to figure things out in Vegas. I've said it over and over again. I, 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 I'd probably quit football if I had to play for somebody else. You know, I, I am a Raider for my entire life. I'm going to root for one team for the rest of my life, and uh, it's the Raiders. I think we can all agree that if, if we were able to pull it off and win a championship here, that, that would feel much better than just piling a whole bunch of great players together and figuring and joining up and doing it that way. Mina, you were kind of grimacing when Carr said he'd probably quit football if he had to play anywhere else. How much of the Raiders' issues fall on Derek Carr? You know. Uh, I'm tired of the Derek Carr hate, to be honest. I mean, he hasn't been perfect, but he's been solid. He's gotten better. Last year, he had one of the best seasons of his career, especially when it came to pushing the ball downfield. Derek Carr is not perfect, but he's not the problem. The problem is, and it's been this way for a long time, the defense. The defense has been horrible. I mean, to call it a train wreck, would be inaccurate because that would imply at some point in recent history it's been moving in the right direction, which is not true. Uh, some of these problems predate the John Gruden era, but it's gotten progressively worse in recent years. And, and I know John Gruden's an offensive coach, but ultimately he's also the head coach and the buck stops with him. And for all of the criticism of Derek Carr and the trade rumors and the questions about whether the Raiders are gonna draft a quarterback, the defense is the issue, and it drives me crazy that they haven't gotten more heat for how bad that unit has been. 
Yeah, look, the Raiders are an example of, quite honestly, what's wrong with the NFL right now as far as the discussion around football teams, which is always, you know, quarterback, quarterback, quarterback. Talk to me about the offense. How many yes. points are they scoring? How many wides are they putting out on the football field? What kind of wide receivers do they have? How many? And then they, you just kind of ignore the other two phases of the game. People do that to the Raiders all the time. I'm with Mina. I have gotten into arguments with, with Raider Nation over and over and over again, and I love them to death. Everybody knows how, how much affection I have for the Raiders. But they're dead wrong here as far as always getting on Derek Carr and the fact that this offense needs to go out and get Aaron Rodgers or get Russell Wilson or get Deshaun Watson. They need to get their rear ending gear as far as this defense is concerned because a lot of assets have been devoted to that side of the football, both in free agency and in the draft. They've had now, they're going on what, their third defensive coordinator, Paul Gunther, then Rod Marinelli takes over. Now Gus Bradley is there. And I'm telling you what, they have been last. Bad, last, bad, 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 bad. Simple as that. John needs to fix it. He's the GM. He's the de facto decision maker. Heck, he's probably, he's probably just as powerful as Mark Davis himself. Mm. Get it fixed. Leave hey. Derek Carr alone. I love it. Uh, listen, Lewis, that's the thing, though. You're saying get it fixed. This guy, John Gruden, has got six more years on this deal. How do they do that? I mean, it's time to get it fixed, right? But how do you say with that type of uh, belief in him that he's going to do that in the next six years? Yeah, look, I mean, I know it sounds simplistic what I'm saying here, just saying get it fixed. Somewhere in their team-building structure and in their process, they have to start selecting and then developing and utilizing better. That's really where it's breaking down. The selection part, identifying the right players, both football and personal character and physical traits, and then developing them and using them. So somewhere along the line, either the people who are selecting them or the people that are developing them and utilizing them are getting it wrong. John plays a big role in both phases. He selects them, yes. and then he picks the people who help develop and utilize them. So really the buck stops with him. Simple as that. Yes, Lewis is 100% right, in case, in case you couldn't tell by my uh, church hands there. I was trying to channel Marcus Spears. The <laughs> defensive coaches report to John Gruden. He is the head coach of this football team. The Raiders have drafted defensive players in the first round. We don't have to go over their history. They have signed uh, free agents. This year it was Yannick Ngakwe. Those free agents and those high draft picks need to produce in their system. That it, it's a simple answer because that's what it takes. And if they can't do that after this year, I think some serious questions need to be asked of the entire organization. Can somebody clip off that video of Lewis just going bad, 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 bad? It was so good. All right. <laughs> a lot of that's questions. I, can think of is bad. The, I know. A lot of questions at the quarterback uh. position in the AFC East, guys. What do we expect from Tua in year two? Does Mac Jones play at all? In